The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Shu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating. We've just entered into our 12th season, digging into the why, why, whys of people's behavior when it comes to modern dating, modern romance, modern sex, modern everything, (laughs) as well as your own freaking behavior. Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you? That's the million dollar (laughs) question. But we have a behavioral scientist here with us today, Logan Yuri, who's going to explain exactly why we do the things we do. Why we're looking for things that are not what you actually need in a long term partner. I think that's the theme of the episode. And in addition to that, we learned a little bit about Logan's own life and some of the recent events that have completely shifted her relationship and her uh, new marriage, I guess. I mean, she's, mm-hmm. she hasn't been married that long. But it's a, again, it's another great interview with her. We've had her on the show before. She is a fan favorite. And her book had just released and it's already topping the charts on Amazon and a bunch of other Amazing. lists. So congratulations, Logan. You got to listen to this episode because she just adds even more knowledge than the last time she was on. Yeah, I'm so, we're so excited that, first of all, someone in the Dateable fam published an amazing book. That mm-hmm. is a huge accomplishment. And I think, Logan, like, we've known her now for how long? Like, two years? Two, yeah, and two years. You actually call it out of this episode that she is now initiated as a Dateable regular. Because between a couple episodes now, and we did a live show in San Francisco with yep. her before shit hit the fan with COVID, <laughs> she was kind of like our opener. That, And she also interviewed us, which was super fun. And then she was on our recent sounding board event. So she's been with us a bit. And we're super excited to people love, love, love this stuff. So we're excited to bring new knowledge uh, in this episode. It's a great follow up to Connor Beaton, you know, you like open with Connor, and then you follow (laughs) up with Logan. I don't know what What's a better way to kick off the season? Actually, I do know a better way to kick off the season. Oh, yes. <laughs> our feature in the New York Times. What the fuck? We have this Google <laughs> alert set up for us. And that morning I woke up, it was on Sunday. It was actually on Valentine's Day. I woke up and I got this Google alert. And usually it's about like data science because, you know, it like dateable <laughs> as, a, as a Google alert. Usually it's some like published paper in some, oh, I don't know, in some magazine that I've never heard of. But this was in the New York Times and I screamed. I woke up so early that day. I don't know why. I was just like, oh, I feel like I need to wake up early. <laughs> you did because I woke up to like a shit ton of text <laughs> messages and messages. And I was like, oh my God, can you post this in the group? You're like, I've already posted it in the group, but the Instagram, like anywhere that you basically could think of. But it was, it was amazing. Like, I'm so glad that you saw that and had the alert. Like, just... You know, like the New York Times, there's, first of all, like who even thinks that there's still an actual newspaper out? Like, I thought that was amazing. We had one of our past guests, Amanda, she texted us. It was like, here's like the actual photo of the newspaper. I'm going to put all of this on YouTube because people need to see the visual representation of what we're talking about. But if you happen to get a copy of the New York Times, we were in the at home section. The article is mm-hmm. called Dating Podcast to Make You Feel Better About about your love life and it it has our picture <laughs> I know. Seeing our photo under New York Times, like even the digital, but I think just even a paper, like there's something about the analog of a newspaper. And it's funny, I was actually walking to Safeway, I was talking to my brother on the phone about it. And he is a New York Times subscriber. So he was like, cutting it out, he was like, putting it in a file cabinet, so it like preserved that he was gonna like mail it out to us. And then he's like, you know, you could just buy a copy, like it's available all day. And I'm like, ah, that's a good idea. So I was like, walking to Safeway to pick up a cake for Chinese New Year's because mm. I went to a friend's like outdoor and I'm like, oh, I'm actually going. But I popped into this like corner store on the way and there was actually this really hot guy that was in there too. And I'm like, hey, 
do you guys sell newspapers? And the guys like literally both laughed at me. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I guess not. I guess it's like a, they stopped doing this at corner shops and bodegas a few years ago. I went into my corner bodega and the guy was like, I haven't had a newspaper in here in two years. Yeah. Suddenly they just stopped giving us newspapers. And he he told me to try 7-Eleven. So if anybody's looking for mm -hmm. actual newspapers <laughs> that are timely, <laughs> go to 7-Eleven or Safeway, I guess. That's where you found yours. Yep, Safeway. Safeway did not have Chinese New Year's cakes this year. I got this like beautiful one there last year. So that's why I was like thinking about it. I totally like fogged on the sense that it was Valentine's Day on Sunday. Oh. So I showed up at Safeway and literally like every single cake was Valentine's Day. So I ended up getting one with like red roses and just like having the guy write like Happy New Chinese New Year. <laughs> but he was Chinese. So he wrote it and actually it didn't look that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it was a makeshift Chinese that New That sounds Year's like cake. one of those things that, like you get drunk and get a tattoo of Chinese uh, characters on your arm. The next morning you wake up and you're like, what does this say? And, and your Chinese friend's like, it says bird shit or some, them, <laughs> something yeah. like that. That's what my friends were joking. They're like, he could have literally wrote anything. Yeah. He would have been like, like yep. this looks fantastic. He also had no idea what I was asking for at first. Like, I think he thought I was like trying to say like happy birthday or something to someone. He's like, what is this dumb white girl like asking me right this minute? <laughs> but they ended up like, it was like they ended up pulling over someone that was more like English speaking. And then she was like, oh, do you actually want it written in Chinese? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So she like pulled the original guy back over. It was like a production, but got the New York Times, got the cake. So it was a win. Check, check, <laughs> check. Needed take a picture of that cake i would love to see what his chinese letters well look like. it's, it's gone it's oh eaten. damn it, <laughs> so, damn it. <laughs> actually i think i might i might have taken a photo i'll send it okay, to you i hope you have a photo of it our chinese new year's was a little bit different we did not have cake but my mom went to the local fish market and got fresh uni mm. that we watch a bunch of youtube videos to see how we can crack it I had no idea those things like there look there seems to be like a hole in the middle that looks like an eyeball and you put two spoons through the hole and then you crack it open. It is disgusting. And inside there's maybe like five or six uni pieces. That's it. Everything else is just gush. It's disgusting. I'm like, I that think I'd rather <laughs> not sound good at all. <laughs> no, like I'm never going to eat my own crack my own uni. I'm just going to get it at a restaurant when it's all yep. beautifully plated. <laughs> There's some things that I'm like, I've tried to recreate cooking, and I'm like, mm, I think this one needs to be safe for a restaurant dining experience. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> no, not doing that again. But it was fun to crack through a, an eyeball <laughs> with all the spikes. I was out for dinner with some friends. Of, a couple past dateable guests, too, were there in Ooh. the um, the group. But one of our one of my male friends, he's like the best PR rep, and I told him like we should hire him because like anytime like someone new is in the crowd, he's like, "This is my celebrity friend." And this was even before <laughs> the New York Times article came out. So if only this was a day after, it would have oh, been man. like ten times. I'm like, can I just have you like follow me around San Francisco and like introduce me to everyone this way? Because it's like the best way for new listeners too. All these people are like, yeah, I'm gonna check it out. So we're just so <laughs> not good at self promo. So you listen to our previous episodes. We've talked about this too. We always have other people promoting us for us, which is great, but we need to learn how to do that ourselves too. Like this New York Times feature is a huge accomplishment. I'm just yes. going to take a moment to say, I don't think that, I don't like to say we're deserving because I don't think anybody's deserving of anything, but we work damn hard. And I'm like super proud of us too, because this was not something we expected. We did not ask for yeah. it. We did not go out and reach, to the, reach out to the writer for it. It came out of the blue and it was such a nice surprise and I'm so fucking proud of us. <laughs> but it's our it's our community. Like Phoebe, who is the writer, was actually in our Facebook group. And while we're calling you out, we just wanted to say thank you, Phoebe. Phoebe Lett, who is the writer. I was actually just so grateful for the way that Phoebe wrote about us too. Because a lot of times people will just copy and paste our, you know, like our description, which is fine. You know, we're not going to complain ever. But I loved how like thoughtful this one was. Mm -hmm. And she said something at the end that I think needs to actually be in our description and like the way we describe this podcast, that we're essentially on a mission that makes everyone feel deserving and dateable. We really truly believe that all of you that listen are dateable and being dateable again does not 
relate to your relationship status. So even like if you are feeling like alone and single, like that does not mean that you're not dateable. There's nothing wrong with you per se. Yeah, that line made me cry because it resonated with our values that we haven't really mm-hmm. put into words. And that's why we do what we do. This community really drives that purpose for us. And it just gives us ammunition to keep going with this, with these values that we're living by. So thank you again to the community for helping us manifest this. This is just yep. a huge accomplishment for us. And I think it's just going to kick off even more grand things coming for all of us in this new year, including the most dateable competition oh my god i cannot wait first of all like i just want to okay so ua and i split out a lot of the efforts that go into dateable because there's a lot of stuff that goes up behind the scene but i just want to commend you because i feel like you have done an amazing job just being like the front runner organizer of this event and also i love just like how alive you get when it comes to planning these events like i could tell (laughs) how much you just like truly love it i'm like she is just like loving every minute of even like the setup and the rehearsals and all that. So I think it's like you definitely very much shine with these types of events. Oh, thank you so much, Julie. You know what I love about these things is like we get to know a little bit of someone, a little bit of of something new about someone in our community. And we get to see these different sides of them, including the talent competition, the Q&A. It's just fun getting to know people on a different level. Mm -hmm. And everyone has expressed that they're feeling uncomfortable, which I love. Once we get (laughs) past that comfort, that's when we grow, that's when we change. And all six contestants are like, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with this, (laughs) with what I'm doing and putting myself out there, but fucking good for you, right? All six of them. I'm so proud of all six of them. Yeah, I am too. I cannot wait to see this. I think it's going to be so fun. Like these types of competitions are really fun. There's been one in San Francisco for years that's happened. I mean, not this year, obviously with COVID. They totally should have made it virtual though, by the Mm -hmm. way, but whatever we're stealing the thunder yeah (laughs) we're stealing the thunder this year but i think these events like they're meant to be like silly and goofy like obviously it's not like like everyone's dateable even if you did not get selected to be in this but it's just really fun and it's really meant to be lighthearted and to come out and support your fellow community members so hopefully all of you can join like this is an event that's open to the public like it is um, one of our sounding board events but usually it's required to be a member but this one we're letting anyone join so you can get your tickets at datablepodcast.com slash events. And I love the the three judges that were secured too. Can we talk about them for a second? Because this is going to make this event even more fun. Well, you know that my girl crush, May Lee, my girl <laughs> is on the panel. She is a, a renowned journalist and also someone I want to be when I grow up, hopefully even <laughs> half as awesome as she is. She was on our season finale for season 11 on um, Can You Have It All? And she will be one of the judges. Yep. And then we also have Misha Byreich, who is a, one of our crowd favorites. If for anyone that remembers The Art of Virtual Sex, this was in season mm. 10. And he had a very seductive voice. And we're super excited to hear that as he, you know, like critiques the different contestants. <laughs> and our third and final judge is all about schemas. You guys remember schemas? I need to stop singing. If you guys tell me that I need to stop <laughs> singing in the reviews, I, I will know. <laughs> Keep singing, keep singing. (laughs) Get ready for the most dateable. I want to hear you introduce the 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 judges in the singing voice. I don't know what's what's come of me. I normally don't do that. Uh, Doctor Abigail Lev, she will she is going to be the therapy representative for Mm -hmm. the judges panel, asking questions that go a little bit deeper to to help you self-reflect and for us to uncover true colors. I really feel like this is the most like perfect panel ever. Like all Mm. three of them have such different perspectives. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. And for anyone who's coming new to our podcast, you're like, what the hell is the most dateable competition? Think of it as a co-ed pageant, but that's more exciting 
exciting than your traditional <laughs> pageant. It's all virtual. We have three different competitions within that night. The first one is going to be a most dateable showcase. You'll learn more about that at the show. Second stage is going to be talent. And third is Q&A with the judges where the contestants have not seen or heard the questions that the judges are going to ask. And then at the end, we crown one person as most dateable 2021. Love it. Love Ew. it. So yeah, a quick, maybe a couple quick announcements before we get into it, because there's been so much interesting stuff, but mm -hmm. we obviously want to get to the good stuff with Logan. Just a couple quick announcements. We're doing something new that every month we're going to kind of do like a community member of the month. Yeah. Someone that exhibits the true qualities of what it means to be dateable, whether that's, you know, committing to your own self growth and us seeing that through like the types of posts you put up in the community or the questions you're asking at happy hours or sounding board events, all of that. And then also supporting others like in the mm -hmm. community and like not just saying like, oh, he sucks or she sucks, but like really like digging in and like helping people get to what's going on for them and offering a diverse perspective that kind of lets people be like, hmm, what about this way? So our first person that we decided to choose can we give a little drum roll? I feel like uh, you're good at that. <laughs> so the drum roll winner was Sonia Pennich. Woo! Sonia! And yeah, Sonia, honestly, I, she was like a clear winner in my mind. I just feel like I saw her like comment about things that she learned in the schemas workshop from the sounding board. And I'm like, wow, she's like really moving this stuff forward. And it was changing how she like evaluated things. So yeah, just overall, she also posted about master dating, our favorite term of basically <laughs> doing solo dates. And she did like a tr uh, wine tasting trip to Sonoma. And so she fun. like really inspired a ton of people and was like, you know what, like it's it's not weird. Like people think it's going to be weird, but no one looked at me weird. And then when they did, I just started a conversation with them and like all was forgotten that I was on my own. And, you know, I obviously want a partner, but I'm not going to just sit around and not have fun while I don't have one. Mm -hmm. And that's the best attitude. I love that, Sonia. And all of all of our members that we're going to profile are pioneers. I'm going to call them dating pioneers because we're throwing the rules out the window. We're saying no to the old traditions and creating your new traditions and new norms. Like, mm -hmm. who cares in the past this was not okay or people would look at you funny or judge you for this. It doesn't even matter anymore. It's your life. And these are the members who are pioneering their own dating ways and their own lives and good for them and we we can't wait to feature even more of our members who are mm -hmm. who are paving their own path it's so funny because in the last episode with logan we had this whole phrase like date like a scientist mm -hmm. you know like trying to figure stuff out and you and i were actually talking to a uh, member of the sounding board the other day this concept came up of date like a podcaster mm -hmm. and i think there's both right they both work in different ways but date like a podcaster is ask a lot of questions don't make assumptions mm -hmm. Get curious, like all of that. So kind of bring your scientist hat and your podcaster hat. And that's like a great way to become the, you know, community member of the month. It's like, what would Julie and Yue say? What would Julie and Yue do in this situation? <laughs> that was a good segue to our birch contest because we we encouraged our that said um, we'll give him a shout out, Sakib. We we encouraged Sakib to submit that to the merch contest. We did a contest, a crowdsourced merch contest in the Facebook group, the Love in the Time of Corona, the public group. Mm -hmm. And this idea came from Jasmine, so I want to give Jasmine a shout out too for coming up with the idea. But as you all know, we launched our merch shop, datablepodcast.com slash shop back in November. Yeah, it was like right mm -hmm. before uh, Black Friday, C Cyber Monday. And there was this idea of like, hey, can the community come up with like sayings to put on merch and we can all vote? And then, yeah, we decided to actually do the contest. And basically people submitted all their ideas and people could upvote on the ones they liked the best. There actually ended up being a tiebreaker between um, I'm Datable Are You and then the winner <laughs> that we ended ended up choosing and the winner actually will get a piece of merch with their saying so they'll get to pick what they want and we'll print them for other people too so anyone that entered the contest will get a promo code but anyone that you know didn't enter that just wants to buy the merch like it will be public for everyone so should we announce the winner i know we announced it in the facebook group but it was it went to ryan jeffrey yay ryan his saying was own your baggage don't just carry it around yeah so yeah i love it i love it people are 
are just really like that one. So we will be putting it on. I could totally see that as like a luggage um, sticker. Or like a oh, sticker yeah. for your luggage. That's a good idea. <laughs> or it should go on top of a suitcase. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there needs to be some suitcase tie-in with it. But I could see it on like a hat or something too. There's many ways or a backpack. that this one could work. Yeah, backpack. That would be cool. Oh, yeah. Duffel bag or pack- backpack. Yeah. I love so it. Yes. We will be creating the merch in the upcoming weeks and we'll let you all know when it's available on the store, but you can get everything else. I know the socially distant yet socially available one has been flying off the shelves, especially after last week's episode. So Ryan, actually the same person that won the contest, he sent us a photo of him in the airport wearing the sweatshirt with like 10 masks and a face shield. So it was goggles. a good look. Goggles. goggles. Yes. <laughs> I think the goggles really made the outfit. It was hot. It was hot. <laughs> you always like, did anyone ask you about the sweatshirt? He's like, nope, but I got a bunch of looks. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes viral the next day. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Spotted at the airport. Well, congratulations to you, Ryan. If anybody else has other ideas for merch, just hit us up in the community or you can DM us on Instagram. We love any sayings that come from our listeners. So Keep an eye out for even more new merch coming up. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash shop. And for anybody in the sounding board, you can get discounts in our merch store. So what is the sounding board for anybody new or for if you need a refresher? The sounding board is our premium community. So we have our Facebook group and then we have this smaller group and it's members only. And there are three tiers in the sounding board and you can find out all about it. I won't go into all the tiers here, but you can (laughs) go to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. And this has been a very unique community for us that formed out of COVID, believe it or not. Uh, We have these very intimate discussions. Every month we have an audio series, which is almost like an audio workbook of going addressing like one issue that we deal with, especially when it comes to modern dating, but it's applicable, Mm -hmm. applicable to everything in life. There's um, discounts in the merch store, we have monthly events as well. And our monthly event this month is the most dateable competition. So anybody in the sounding board, that is your event this month. And if you choose, um, depending on which tier you choose, you could also do one on one coffee dates with Julie and I, and we can Mm -hmm. shoot the ship, but it's all about you. So shoot the ship. I think I just said shoot the ship. Don't shoot the ship. (laughs) Shoot the ship with Julie and I. And again, it's just up to you however you want to customize your subscription. It's, um, it's, it has been a very, like I use the word intimate quite a bit for that group because Mm -hmm. it is very intimate. We have these very like vulnerable discussions, believe it or not, with straight, mere strangers that I feel like have become so close, um, during this time. So if you're looking for extra support or extra voices, extra opinions, or just a this idea of a community, a feel a feeling of a like a virtual family, that's where you need to be as the sounding board. Yeah, people have really said that that has been like a game changer. Like I know Janice, our moderator said like, I, she like made a comment just like how much I freaking love everyone in here. And like this feels like actual friends. And I know Shieldy's actually trying to organize a get together where people actually meet in real life pending COVID, of course, but there is like so much going on with that. And of course, if you do join now, you get to go to the event for free, which you mentioned. So if you've been kind of on the edge about joining and you're all Also, like most dateable sounds really freaking awesome. Maybe this is the time to give it a shot. Yep. And if you are like, I'm so confused by everything that just you guys just said, because that was a lot of information, (laughs) just go to (laughs) datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. All that information is laid out for you. And of course, this episode is made possible by our sponsors. Our our first sponsor is a book called Driven by Rebecca Zanetti. This is the fourth book in Zanetti's heart-pumping romantic suspense series featuring operatives in a secretive Homeland Defense Department. All the previous releases in the series were USA Today bestsellers, so you know this is going to be good. Known for her high-octane action, scorching sensuality, and strong yet emotionally complex characters, award winning author Rebecca Zanetti has had nearly a dozen books selected as Amazon best romances of the month, including Lethal Lies, Mercury Striking, and Fallen. In this fourth installment, New York Times bestselling author Zanetti mixes high-octane action with even more intense romantic tension as two mis- 
misfit operatives in a secret Homeland Defense Department chase down a diabolical serial killer. To learn more about Driven by Rebecca Zanetti, just head on over to kensingtonbooks.com or wherever books are sold. And here's another book we love to highlight. This episode is also brought to you by The Duke Heist by Erica Ridley. A secret identity's forbidden love opposites attract romance from a New York Times bestselling author. Why seduce a Duke the normal way when you can accidentally kidnap one in an elaborately planned heist? Here are the deets. Years ago, Chloe Winchester and five other uniquely talented orphans were adopted by a wealthy baron with a secret mission. The Motley Winchester family fights for justice from the margins of high society. So some reviewers, have compared the series to one of my favorite series on TV right now, The Umbrella Academy. Now, it's not paranormal, but there's a strong family dynamic and each sibling has a very unique skill that helps them save the day. Grab your copy of The Duke Heist at your favorite store or visit ericaridley.com for more information. There's a special bonus for a limited time. If you buy The Duke Heist and register your purchase on Erica's website, she'll send you a free bonus Winchester novella. Visit Erica Ridley. That's spelled E-R-I-C-A-R-I-D-L-E dot com. And stay tuned after this episode for a free sample of the audiobook of The Duke Heist. Cool. So shall we get into Logan? Logan Yuri, let's hear from her. We've got a fan favorite back. And I also think that I'm just gonna make this rule now. If you've been a guest on either on our show or a live event for three or more times, you're a regular. We're gonna call yeah. you a regular. So Hall of Fame, dateable Hall yeah, of Fame, <laughs> VIP. Not only is she a fan favorite, she's also VIP Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame regular. Her name is Logan Yuri. She was on season nine, episode fourteen, on a very popular episode called "The Science of Dating." Hi, Logan. How are you? Hi, I'm so glad to be back, and thank you for the uh, title regular. I'm very excited. (laughs) Plaque is in the mail. We just got it made today. (laughs) So Logan's been a guest on our podcast. She was also a guest at our live show, which was IRL, which seemed oh, yeah. like 30 oh my God, years ago. I forgot about that. Yes. So That's you're right. Like four Probably one of the now. last IRL events. Yep. A- absolutely. For and anyone. we did it at a <laughs> toilet showroom. I mean, how can yeah. you remember? Okay. Hey, we're not supposed to tell people that you... <laughs> Seize the bidet. Seize the bidet. Seize the bidet. Hey, it was a very expensive bidet. As we realized that you could get a bidet for ten grand, so yep. it was no cheap. Okay, toilet that we were talking about. And she was also most recently on one of our sounding board events talking about the science of dating, but also her latest book, How to Not Die Alone. She's a behavioral scientist turned dating coach and an internationally recognized expert on modern love. As the director of relationship science at the dating app Hinge, Logan, this is actually Julie's favorite app, just uh, for the record. Logan leads a research team dedicated to helping people find love after studying psychology at Harvard. Never heard of it. She ran Google's behavioral science team, the Irrational Lab. She was a 2018 TED resident and again, originally from South Florida. She now lives in the Bay Area with her husband, Scott, and they've been living there for the last 10 years. Welcome back. Welcome. So glad to have you. you. So glad to be here. Yay. Wish we were all in person, but happy to be doing this. I feel like I've seen you a lot, but then I realized that you're right. The last time we saw you in real life was over, over, a, year over a year ago. Yeah, right? over a year December ago. 2019 event. Yeah. I know. I think what always what always fascinates me about your stuff is you like I feel like you call it like you see it in the sense that we are rational people. We all mm-hmm. think we know what we want, but we never actually know what we want. And I feel like so often we hear that we're supposed to fall in love. Like why do you think that we need to like think more in terms of love? Yeah, I love that question. There's so many directions I can take it. So one thing is that people sometimes say to me, oh, you're trying to turn love into this rational thing. Love is this explosive chemical thing. Why are you applying rationality to it? And while love is a very natural reaction, dating is not. Dating is something that we have created. Dating is something that didn't exist um, more than 150 years ago. And dating is really a skill. So what I'm trying to help people with is understand that it's natural to love, Mm -hmm. but 
dating needs to be taught. And what I want people to understand is that if you're dating and things aren't working out for you, it may not be a result of effort. You might be putting in the right amount of effort, dating the right number of people, all of that. You might be stuck in a pattern of bad behavior and you need to actually reflect on that pattern, learn your blind spots, and then overcome them because that's how you change. It's not just effort. It's also breaking bad habits. Mm. So when you say, okay, so love is natural, but dating (laughs) is not natural, and you would also call it irrational. Humans are irrational when it comes to finding a life partner. Why is that? Why why is we take something that's so natural to us, but then we irrationalize it? Yeah. So my background is in behavioral science. That's the study of how people make decisions. And one of the key tenets of behavioral science is that we're irrational, but in these predictable ways. And so what that means is that we all have these cognitive biases, these sort of brain clouds that consistently trip us up. So one of them is that we tend to act not in our own best interest. So we'll say, I want to save for retirement, but then there's a sale at West Elm and we Mm. buy tons of new rugs for an apartment. Or we (laughs) say we want to eat healthy and then there's a bagel place and we eat a big bagel. So it's like we have these goals, but we tend to prioritize the present and not the future and we get in our own way. And that happens with love in particular, right? So we're irrational in all areas, especially matters of the heart. And so what that looks like is you might consistently be tripped up by the kind of person who makes you feel one way and you kind of get addicted to that feeling of like chase and the rejection. But actually what's best for you is to be with someone who responds to your text, who shows that they're interested in Mm. you, who would be a loyal, kind, long-term partner. So what I'm trying to really do in the book and in general in life is help people understand your irrational brain Mm. is getting in the way of you making better decisions in dating. And when you can learn that better decision in dating, that's how you break the bad habit and find love. And so in your own personal story, and I want to get into this a little bit sooner than later, because I think a lot of times with experts such as yourself, us as podcast hosts, we are constantly extracting information from you, yet we don't know much about you. And I think what I really want to do with this episode is turn it around. I want to learn more about Logan, because obviously you got into this for reasons outside of academia. And you have said that you swiped left on your husband, Scott. Tell <laughs> us more about that because you're now happily married, but you know there, there could have been this little sliding doors chance that you didn't meet. Yeah, absolutely. I actually have the chills when you said that because even though I wrote it, I haven't really had someone reflect it back to me. And like just hearing it, I kind of had the feeling of like, what if I hadn't met him again? And like, yeah. this is the person that I chose. I love this person. And so, I'm really happy to share my story. And I think in general, the best way to learn is through stories. And obviously that's what you do with the podcast. And so if I can share my journey of being unhappy and dating to now happily married, I really want to use that to empower people. So yeah, so Scott and I met in college and we know this because he wrote on my Facebook wall in 2007. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Facebook. Yep. (laughs) It's, you know, a really random story. The guy I was dating at the time was in a math class with him. They lived in the same dorm and we ended up probably sitting near each other in the cafeteria and meeting that day. Didn't see each other. We're Facebook friends. Seven years later, he comes up to me at Google near the Google shuttle and says, hey, you know, didn't you date so-and-so in college? I'm I'm this person. And, and I said, yes. And a few weeks or months later, I invited him to a college alumni lunch. We had lunch. I said, oh, I'm trying to learn this coding language called R. And he said, I just dropped out of a PhD in that coding language. <laughs> And what was so interesting is that we became friends. He started tutoring me. He was a really good tutor. And the whole time, I didn't think of him as anything more than a friend. Mm. I was dating tons of people. I was on the apps. It was really like my big year of being single. And that fall, I went to Burning Man, met this guy, totally obsessed with him, chasing him around, like really trying to make it happen really hurting myself with like the pursuit and somebody just not being interested. And then I myself out of kind of desperation went to a dating coach. And through that work, I realized that not only was this person from Burning Man just not the right fit, 
didn't make me feel great, wasn't interested in me. But this person who was already in my life, this guy, Scott, did make me feel the way that I wanted to Mm. feel. Why were we having lunch at work all the time? Why did it go from once a month to once a week to every day? And finally, we just crossed that threshold from friends to more than friends. And so it was really a long time. We didn't start dating until 2015, but we met in 2007. And later I realized that I had actually seen him on a dating app. Uh. I knew that because we had multiple friends in common and that I had seen him and been like, "Mm, he's wearing a tank top. He's not smiling. Mm. Backwards hat a bro, not my type, and that I had actually swiped left on this person on Tinder. And here I was, you know, a while later, absolutely smitten with this person. And now we're married. So you know, what's so fascinating is that this woman in our community made this statement that I felt was so profound that she's like, the one thing that we judge partners on is dating app profiles. But the one thing you never do in a relationship is create a dating app profile. So it's basically like we're judging off of something that really doesn't matter in a relationship. Like, why do you think that we like, we have certain presets with dating apps? Or like, how do you think they might be leading us astray? Like you were just saying, you might have passed over your husband completely. Yeah. So I absolutely love that statement. And I think there's probably a variety of things in life where you're like, the test to get in has nothing to do with what it is. Like, right. is the LSAT really determine how good of a trial lawyer you'll yeah. be? No, that has to do with like, how good are you with this type of uh, logic problem? And so, yeah, I I really like that perspective that the dating app is just the introduction. What matters is how you feel with the person. And so you should really think about the dating app as that first step. And then the date is when you really begin to say, how do I feel around this person? Am I curious about them? Julie, in terms of your question... There's a few different ways that I've found that dating apps can lead us astray. And I should mention that I work at Hinge. I'm very excited about Hinge, passionate about it. And there's a reason why after writing this book, I chose to work there. And that's because I think their whole de- design to be deleted thing mm-hmm. is real. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed the CEO during the process of writing the book. And I was like, there's no way that that's true because wouldn't you just lose all your users? And he was like, no. Like when we started with design to be deleted, we actually became so much more popular than ever mm-hmm. before. So anyway, right. that's my copy. Oh, I love Hedge, as UA pointed out. It's totally. my favorite and by far. And there's always going to be people looking for love. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not anti-dating app, but I do think that there's some flaws with some of the designs of some of the dating apps, especially the ones that are gamified. So one of the big ones is that they've turned us into relation shoppers mm-hmm. instead of relationshippers. And what that means is relationshipping is the process of finding a partner, falling in love, creating a relationship. Relation shopping is this new term that means shopping for a partner as if it was a consumer object. So, you know, you're looking for your new du- Bluetooth headphones and you go to wire cutter and you say, what are the best wireless headphones? And then you head to Amazon and you check out the specs and you're evaluating this as a product. But human beings are not two-dimensional products. They're three-dimensional, real-life people who have to be experienced. And so you can't look for a person the way you would look for headphones. You have to actually experience someone. And so Mm. human beings' dates are much more like movies or wine, where you have to experience them to see if you like them, not a flat object that you can just evaluate based on its specs. Let's just back up for a sec, because I want us to get in the head of Logan Yuri at this time when you realize, <laughs> oh my gosh, this guy who has been in my life is the person for me. Yet I spent all this time and energy chasing people who were not right for me. And I think a lot of people are in this place, but you are the perfect example of someone who is in a relationship where you realize it's really what matters in the long run. And recently you encountered an experience that put everything in perspective. So you wrote this very touching, um, inspirational article in Modern Love in the New York Times. I really want you to share this with our audience because it moved me in so many different ways. It just gave me tears, but also gave me just hope and optimism that I think a lot of daters could hear right now. Sure. Yeah. I'm happy to share that story. And it's interesting because it's ongoing. So it's happening right now. But basically in the book, I talk about the story I just said, where 
you know, I was friends with Scott. Then I had this revelation with the dating coach. And then throughout the book, you learn about us deciding should we get married. And then towards the end of the book, he he proposes, right? So the book sort of ends with like, we're engaged. But then it's a book. I finished it a while ago. Like what happens after that? So what I can share with your listeners is that Scott and I were supposed to get married last August. We postponed because of COVID. Mm -hmm. We found out last spring that he was actually diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer, and we decided to get last minute married. Our friends threw us a socially distanced masked wedding in Golden Gate Park. We had this really wild, just very intense series of days where on a Saturday, our friends gathered on a rooftop and did a foot roast, which was a comedy roast in which people made fun of Scott, made fun of cancer, (laughs) made fun of um, amputation. Sorry, I should mention his bone cancer diagnosis required him to get a below-the-knee amputation Mm -hmm. on his right leg. And the next day, we had this wedding, which was, of course, so intense because people are gathering to celebrate us, but also they know that the scary thing is happening Mm -hmm. and just – it was that much more poignant for many people as the first gathering that they'd been to during COVID and, you know, that moment in the vows of saying like in sickness and in health. Mm-hmm. I think everyone in, in Golden Gate Park who was there was like, you know, took a breath in. It was really intense. And then the next day he had his amputation. He had his surgery. And so our lives just got really challenging. He was in the hospital a lot of the time going through chemo. Because of COVID, we were super isolated. And at a certain point, I was just like, this isn't working. Like, I'm by myself. Nobody can come help us. It was just really, really a solo experience. And so some of our friends had started this communal living place called Radish. And we went to visit and we just had this like really beautiful time. And we laughed for the first time in so long. And we got really lucky. And they had a first floor apartment, which was super important for, you know, accessibility Mm -hmm. reasons. And we moved in a few weeks later. And since then, it's just been such amazing experience. We have... 12 housemates, basically besides us. We live in a one-bedroom apartment, but we have all this communal space and outdoor space and a communal kitchen. And everyone's just been so fantastic, like incredibly supportive, visiting Scott in the hospital, supporting me when I come home. And we call these people other significant others. Mm -hmm. And that's a title that Eli Finkel of Northwestern came up with. And it's based on research from a woman named Elaine Chung that found that we tend to expect to get all of our needs met by Mm -hmm. one person. But if you can go to discrete people for discrete needs. So you go to your exercise loving friend to exercise with, you go to your movie loving friend to go to the movies with, you talk to your music loving friend about music and you don't say to your partner, why aren't you exercising, going to the movies Mm -hmm. and talking about music with me? Those partnerships are happier. Those people are happier. And those people are your OSOs, your other significant others. And so moving into Radish, being surrounded by OSOs has just been such a profoundly helpful and beautiful experience. And really, I think it's a testament to these people and to the power of community, especially during such an isolating time like the pandemic. I think also it shows too that like the stuff that we look for on dating apps, like (sighs) they must have similar interests, they must be over, I don't know, five, eight or whatever it is that is like some arbitrary number. Like at the end of the day, they don't matter. Like it's hard. I think that's what is difficult about and I'm pro dating apps too. I don't want to say I'm not in any way. I think they're a great way to meet people. But it's hard because you've brought this up in our past episodes that you just don't know the qualities. So we're forced to look at that stuff. But your story totally puts in perspective like how in the long haul that stuff is just so unnecessary. Yeah. And I can share one more thing that I've been reflecting on. And as I said, the story's still ongoing. That's still going through chemo. Like there is not that happy ending yet. Like this is very much my life in the present, but. And this is a very rare cancer, right? I think you said only 800 people have it in the US. Yeah, it's 800 Americans a year are diagnosed with this. It's super rare. And one, I mean, just to add some texture to the story, like Scott's not just even a random guy. He's a vegan. He Mm -hmm. is extremely healthy. He read a book called How to Not Die, as opposed to my book, How to Not Die Alone. (laughs) 
<laughs> and his that this book is about, you know, use less olive oil, roast your vegetables, steam it. Like he's really that guy. He's super healthy, works out every day. Puts turmeric in everything. Puts turmeric in everything. <laughs> and he's an AI cancer researcher. He's oh literally works in cancer research. He works in this field. Basically, he cre- he worked on a team that created a model that identifies breast cancer more accurately wow. than mammograms. And it's just like the guy with the cancer screenings. We're sitting together looking at his cancer screens. It's just really surreal. And there's a part in the book where I say, I quote an article called Will He Hold Your Purse? Mm -hmm. What the article Will He Hold Your Purse is about is this woman who is an oncologist. She's talking about her friends who are looking for love and say, oh, he must love fishing. He must love dancing. And she's like, no, like that doesn't matter. Like I see couples going through the hardest thing of their lives. And some couples, the guy holds the woman's purse. And it's this representation of like taking on your burdens and being there for you and anticipating your needs. And like that doesn't happen in every couple. And so she's her definition of what to look for is will he hold your purse? Mm -hmm. And when I think about the last nine months of my life, I'm like, oh, I'm literally holding the purse. I'm holding Mm -hmm. the backpack. I'm holding the crutches. Like the person that I tell you to find in the book, like I'm being that person. So, okay. So for the people that are actively dating right now, like how do you cut through the prompts and like the bullshit essentially to set yourself up to find that person? Yeah. So I know that the dating, you know, let's just talk about the foundations. Dating apps are the most common way that people meet these days. We know the research from Michael Rosenfeld of Stanford. We are in a pandemic. That means really probably the only way you're meeting someone is online. So you are using these apps to meet someone. How do you make the apps work for you? So step one, and I'm sure you've talked about this so many times on the podcast, is just having a strong profile. And I know that that sounds simple, but I just want to go through a couple of the main things. Just, of course, your first photo has to be great. Of course, you need photos that are recent and flattering. Of course, you need photos that show you doing different activities. And you really want to think of your profile as your opening line because that's what people are responding to. So I had a client who did circus and she had a trapeze photo and it was a cool photo. She looked great in it, but everyone would talk to her about trapeze. And I was saying, Mm. yes, because that's your opening line and they're engaging with you. If you don't want to talk about trapeze, don't have a trapeze photo. And of course, your profile prompts need to have vulnerability and humor and show who you are. And if everyone did that, then we would have better interactions on the app. But the much more important thing is to realize you just don't really know what side of you somebody brings out until you have that date. And I'm Mm -hmm. all about the virtual dates. I really have – I've had some very meaningful conversations over video chat this year. I'm not video dating, but I'm certainly, you know, doing therapy over video and talking Mm -hmm. to my family over video. And, like, I've had – You know, when Scott's in the hospital, we're FaceTiming, like there is an intimacy when you can see the person and the richness of the voice. So just the profile is just like the introduction, like get to the date, get to the face to face. If you spend less time saying like, oh, he's a consultant, all consultants are boring, I'm going to say no to him. It's like, what if you actually think, I don't know what I want, my type could be wrong, I could be (laughs) completely misguided about what I think I need in a partner, and instead I'm going to be more open-minded, go out with a variety of people, and pay attention to how I feel around them. And there's exercises that you can do that help train you at getting better at that so that you don't leave a date and say, yep, he checked all the boxes, graduate school, six feet tall, six figure income. And instead you leave the date and say, he made me feel embarrassed. He wasn't affirming and he didn't ask me any questions. I'm not seeing that person again. And like people really need to hone the skill of tuning into how someone makes you feel. And that's advice that works in a job interview Mm -hmm. when you're looking for roommates, when you're dating, like get into your body, get into your emotions. Like what is this person bringing out of you and go for the people that bring out the best side of you. And I, you know, I get disheartened because we see these comments in our Facebook group that are like, oh, she didn't text me back. What should I say next? Or we went on a few different dates, this guy and I, I really like him, but now he's not he's he's being not responsive to my text messages or whatever it may be. I really hope if you're going through that, our listeners, you can listen to Logan's story and think beyond the getting together and kind of almost foreshadow into what your life is like in the future, like when you're old and when you're sitting on the couch during quarantine, because that's doing life together. That's how we should be filtering people because at that point who cares how many texts they sent you 
it doesn't even matter anymore. Right. I think the part that we, I mean, we hear this in our Facebook group too, is that like people don't want to make people a priority if they don't know them yet. So that's where this stuff gets a little tricky of like, you know, like how much can you read into their behavior when you really, they're kind of a stranger. Let's say you've had a couple mm-hmm. video dates with them. Like, let's be honest, like there's this person might not like pause their entire life for you. But I guess what would you say? Like, how can you still evaluate them? Or would you say that you should expect them? them to kind of show up all in one. Yeah, there's a couple layers to that. So one thing is um, I was talking to a dating coaching client recently and she was describing this guy and she was saying, we met up, we had so much fun. He was great. We hooked up. We had a really good time. And since then, like he hasn't really been clear about how he feels about me. And then sometimes he'll text back and sometimes he won't. And like she went on and on about all the ways that he's really been ambiguous mm-hmm. and It just felt like she – oh, then she said, but he talks about celebrating our birthday together and he talks (laughs) about the future and this and that, right? You you totally know this. Future faker. Yes. Yes. Yeah, future faker and it's it's part of like love bombing and I am a narcissist. Mm -hmm. I want to make you fall in love with me versus I actually am interested in you and care about you. And for that, I was just like pay attention to his actions, not his words. Mm -hmm. And I felt like his actions were that he wasn't showing up. Whereas his words were like he was saying he was going to show up. And so I Mm -hmm. think that – I'm sure you've covered this topic before, but it's like the person you want to be with long term, what I call in the book the life partner, Mm -hmm. is the person that shows up, is the person that's reliable, is the person that says, oh, it's important to you that I join your sister's Zoom. I'll be there. The prom Mm -hmm. date is the person that you crush on when you're younger. They're Mm -hmm. cute. They're a fun to dance with at the prom. They look good in the pictures. You want to have sex with them. Go for the life partner, not the prom date because the life partner is the person that is going to follow through. And so reading between the lines in some of these stories, I'm not assuming that anyone who doesn't text back is a quote unquote prom date and not a life partner. But if people actually say like, I want to be treated in a certain way, I want to be with a secure partner who texts when they say they will and makes me feel good about myself and good about the relationship. That's so key. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in the Scott story, what I can share is that I was absolutely anxiously attached That means that I was kind of addicted to the chase. I expected Mm -hmm. that when I dated somebody, they would pull away and I would have to convince them to like me. And that was the pattern that was coming out with the Burning Man guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I started dating Scott, it was totally different. I remember this one time I was was, uh, walking home. I was on to Visadero and he was supposed to meet up with my friends and something happened. And I texted him just like this slew of really angry text messages And I thought that we would get into a fight because that was my behavior, right? I had ignored his calls and then I was doing what's called a protest behavior. And instead (laughs) he just wrote, hey, it sounds like we should talk about this in person. Mm. And it was so So refreshing. Refreshing. It was mind blowing. I was like, oh, that's an option. And it really stopped me. And I, he did a number of things like that where it was like, oh, with the other person, with all the other people, it would have been a fight. And I have this pattern. But because he was securely attached, he broke that pattern and he taught me so much much about how to show up in a relationship. And we did talk about it in person and it totally blew over. And like the anger that I felt in the texting like wasn't there when we met up because mm-hmm. like it wasn't even important. So mm-hmm. when people have a pattern and they keep reinforcing it, they don't get a chance to learn. But by opening who you're interested in, which for me happened through this dating coach, I had a chance to date this different type of person who taught me a different way to date. And that felt so good. And sometimes I say this to Scott, I'm like, we just started dating and kept dating. And he's like, that sounds so bad. That sounds like we weren't like into it or choosing. I was like, no, I was like, it just never, we just never broke up because like nothing bad ever happened. Like it just was working and it kept working and it kept working. And eventually we're like, let's do life together. Right. Mm -hmm. So why do you think you passed him over in the first place on the app? On the app, you know, just silly things. Like I mentioned, he was just things that make no sense. Like he was wearing a baseball cap backwards and he had a tank (laughs) top on and he seemed like this, like I called it in the book, like an unsmiling bro, which like, Mm. not that I couldn't have wound up with a bro, but I was just, sometimes when you're in dating apps, you get really superficial and you're looking at a bunch of people and you're like, would prefer the guy without the tank top and the Mm -hmm. backwards hat. But, you know, Julie, I know you're really interested in this topic of we think we know what we want, but we're wrong. Right. that's a great example where Scott's two-dimensional persona when I was relation shopping made me think he was one person. But Scott's three-dimensional real-life personality is 
the person that makes me happiest in the world. And so the takeaway isn't dating apps mislead you because you can't find anyone. It's realize that they're limited in what they can show you Mm -hmm. and get to the date as soon as possible. So, but then here's the question then. You can't, it's impossible to go on dates with everybody that you come (laughs) across on a dating app. Now you can, if it's a video date, you can. (laughs) (laughs) And of course there needs to be, even if there's no rhyme or reason, we all need somewhat of filters Mm -hmm. to decide who we want to swipe on. So how do we reconcile that? Because now you're saying we should be more open on who we're swiping on. At the same time, we can't swipe on everyone. Or can we? Just or can I, I really need to ask Julie how what's your uh what's your record for most video dates in a week? In a week. Ooh, in a week. I wanna hear this. I'd say maybe like maybe it's like three. I don't know. I haven't like been tracking. I'll start I, tracking for you. That's great. I mean, good for you. That's, that's that a makes lot, me actually. happy. And I, I hope someone listening is like, wow, I've barely gone gone on any. So anyway, I applaud you, Julie. For- you know you can just have your own Zoom room and just yeah. keep it open and just <laughs> yeah, give everybody the hours. same. Office hours with Julie. <laughs> and people just pop in. They might overlap, it. whatever. I it. it's cool. I love it. I'm going to start oh doing that. Gosh. 10 a that's day. so <laughs> funny. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, just like, I'll just be like, everyone on the dating app, here is my Zoom link. Here's like, my Zoom link. We don't even need yeah. to chat. Let's Drop just in whenever us. you want. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Behavioral scientist, tactic, good or bad? What do you think? What's the burden? <laughs> I mean, honestly, this is a hard year. I am applauding anyone that is putting themselves out there, figuring out the virtual date thing, learning how to be vulnerable. You know, you still need to find love, even if the world feels like it's ending. So I just congratulate you for for being on dates in any capacity. Okay, so back to UA's question, though, about sure. like, let's say hypothetically, do you, you don't have the time to go on like hundreds of dates in a week. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And it is something that I thought about in the book where I was like, does this feel like an inconsistency? How do I explain mm-hmm. this? So I can walk you through my logic, which is, of course, you need to filter, you can't go on dates with everyone, but filter based on the right things. And so let's first talk about what filtering based on the wrong things is. Mm-hmm. So I have a chapter about what matters more than you think in long-term relationships and what matters less. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Some of the things that matter less than you think are physical attractiveness, money, similar Mm. personalities, Mm -hmm. and shared hobbies. The things that matter more than people think they do are kindness and emotional stability, Mm -hmm. loyalty, the ability to make hard decisions together, the side of you that they bring out, and having a growth mindset. Mm. What's very challenging is that things like looks and money, which is some, you know, your job can sometimes be a proxy for money. Those are really easy to tell on a dating app, right? Right. You're skimming through. Other things like loyalty, kindness, ability to make hard decisions together, those are not easy to filter on. And so that that is a genuine challenge. But the point is that if you can give less credence to the dating app profile and actually just start getting out there and going on dates, then you can start to develop these skills and you can look for these things. So a good proxy for loyalty loyalty is, does this person have a lot of friends from different stages of their Mm. lives? Or are they that more fair weather friends where they go through different phases of having this party group and this group and things like that? Or when it comes to kindness, are they the kind of person that helps somebody move? Are they respectful to the server when Mm -hmm. it comes to making hard decisions together? COVID is actually a great time to evaluate that. Are you talking about how you're going to navigate the first kiss and what have your COVID precautions been and how should we manage the fact that we're both in pods with older people? So it's really important to realize that while you do need to filter, you need to filter on the right things. Mm -hmm. And so maybe remove your height preference. So maybe you need to remove some filters like height, you know, if this person went to college, maybe even like living in a neighborhood really close Mm -hmm. to you, but you need to add some filters. Like how does this person make me feel? What side of me does this person bring out? And I I totally understand that those are not things that you can evaluate on in the app. Right. But that's okay. Changing the framework is saying, if I just understand that the app doesn't give me the information I need, then I'll just look at people whose profiles interest me, do the best to connect and get on a date quicker. And so it's not like, it's not like, 
like a game where there's a secret code and now you know how to evaluate profiles. <laughs> it's more like the game and the the secret code is that there is no secret code to evaluating profiles. And instead, you just have to go on the date. So this is how I use dating apps. And it's very different than a lot of people in our Facebook community, I've realized, Ooh. is that I just, I don't read people's profiles as I swipe. I do like kind of a gut reaction. I probably swipe on more people than not sometimes. And then from there, I put more weight on the actual conversation. And also look at who re- like reaches out to me or who I feel compelled to reach out after reading their profile. Because I just feel like there's so many factors of like, you know, someone might not even be active on on this or yeah. you know they might not be interested in me too so I don't want to spend like 30 minutes dissecting their profile if they're not going to even swipe back on me and I personally would rather have more conversations because I think yes you're not going to get the full picture through like a text message type conversation but I do think you can start to like get a vibe and energy you can see if they're asking you questions back you can see just how a conversation is flowing and that's kind of how I whittle it down even further to people that I want to take to a video call And then from there, people that I want to actually meet in real life. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I think that what we've seen in the research at Hinge is that video chats are this great low pressure vibe check. It's way less intense to set up than a real date. You know, you're not spending money on drinks. You're not necessarily like using a lot of eyeliner. You're just saying, do we have (laughs) chemistry? Do you make me laugh? Do I like the sound of your voice? Right. It's just like this gut check. And so that's been really helpful. And I totally agree with what you're saying about the conversation, which is, is this person putting in effort? Right. Or is this person what we call ZQ, zero questions? Oh, my God. (laughs) Yes. Those people kill me. Yes, exactly. And and so, right, it's like emojis. Or like, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, like the one word response back and like you're Absolutely. the only one carrying the convo. It's like, no, it's the worst. <laughs> so if we have to summarize it, it's realize that the profiles are pretty superficial. Get to the chat. In the chat, say, is this per- person putting an effort? Do we seem to be getting along? Do the video chat. Do the vibe check. And then from there, you really start to get to know the person. And if you move away from dating apps or a game to dating apps are basically the modern matchmaker. And right. it's just how Intro. I find the person that I, yeah. That I, that I go out with, I think that you put less pressure on interactions of the app and gaming the app and much more like, how do I show up for a date in the right mindset? How do I ask questions that get to know the right person? Like, there's just so much talk about the apps. It's like mm-hmm. the dates are what lead to a relationship exactly. and that's what you're looking for. I mean, I would have totally swiped over my ex who I met on Hinge, like if I was really dissecting his profile. But I think one of the things I really liked about him is he wasn't someone that was like obsessed with dating apps. So he just put up a profile that looked like normal enough, like there was an attraction enough. And then when we actually met in person and started talking, that's when it like really grew a lot more. Totally. I think the intro, looking at it that way, is such a better perspective check than, like you were saying, like, what are all the levers you can pull and all that? I feel like we just look at dating profiles like a pageant. These are people coming on stage for you to judge them, and then we make a judgment on them. But I think the other way of looking at profiles is, I like playing the game, why did they choose this picture? So if you go through some profile, they obviously intentionally pick these photos because they want to convey some sort of image about them. If they do have a picture of them in a at a party with red cups, that person who chose that picture did not want to use that picture to convey that they're kind or family oriented. They want to show that they are fun and they like the party. So instead of like us being like, oh, this person's this, this and that, I, I think another way is to think, why why did this person choose this photo? What are they trying to convey? I, I think that's really clever and it does follow a piece of advice that I often give coaching clients who are either dating or in relationships, which is get curious. So for example, I had a client who was moving in with his then girlfriend, now fiance, and she was holding on to a lot of her physical objects and he's a minimalist and he was like, what am I doing with this maximalist, this hoarder? And I said, get curious. Ask her what those objects mean to her. Ask her what her history is. Maybe this has to do with her family's financial situation or her her parents' financial situation growing up. Just get curious. And so I love that frame of why did 
this person make this decision? I was going to say at the same time, I've seen this inconsistency in dating apps where when you're evaluating profiles, you think, why did they choose this photo? It must have meaning. But when people set up profiles, yeah. that's actually not their mindset. I've walked a lot of people through profile creations and this is what they do. They say, oh, I'm finally downloading the app. I'm riding this motivation wave and I want to get to my matches as soon as possible. And they go to the photo gallery on their phone mm -hmm. and they pick a couple recent photos. They don't think about how they look in them. They're not really? texting their, yeah, they're not texting their friends for photos of me. This is especially true. I have found for men with, with men. men. Okay. Yeah. I, was I say. think, no, I think for women too. Like, I think, like, I was going to say the same thing. Like, unless you're someone that avidly takes photos, sometimes there's just a certain amount that you have. And if you're out with friends, you might have more photos that look party ish per se, because that's when you're taking photos. Like, when I'm, if I'm reading a book on my couch, I'm not like taking a selfie of myself, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So I think, you know, it depends on the person. Some people are really into photography. Sometimes people keep an album on their phone of good pictures of themselves, but like most people don't. And so it's a couple things. It's the effort you put in. It's the fact that your mindset is I want to get to my matches as soon as possible. It's also that I don't think that we are the best evaluators of pictures that we look good in. Right. One thing that I have done with my clients that I recommend doing in the book is gather a bunch of pictures, put them in an album, send them to friends or even people who you don't know, put them in an album and have people tell you, oh, this is, these are photos I would keep. These are photos I would cut. And this is your best photo. And it's the one that should go first. And so maybe you don't do that the first time you sign up for the app, but like you should be updating your profile and you should be a scientist when you date. You should say, this picture gets a ton of likes and people comment on it. I'll make it first. This one, no one's ever commented on it. Maybe I'll remove it and replace it with something better. I, I think that if we put too much faith in people's profiles and we say they were very intentional about this and this red cup means that they're not ready to have kids, mm -hmm. then we actually might miss out on someone great. And so this is why my recommendation is actually be humble. Realize that none of us are that good at evaluating people in this capacity. And if you actually just put less faith in your ability to evaluate people this way and more time and attention into tuning into how you feel when you're with someone, that is the skill that's worth developing because that's going to help you in every phase of your life. Learning how to evaluate people in a dating app and, and, and assuming that you can read between the lines, like that's just actually not true. And that's not even the skill that's worth developing. So I can hear people asking like, hey, that's great if you have a shit ton of mess like matches. What if I don't have many matches? Like how do I actually apply what you all are talking about when I don't have that many people to even apply it to? Yeah, Julie, that's a really important question. And our mutual friend, Kathan, he came <laughs> to one of my book accountability dinners. So that's when I would write two chapters and have a friend host a dinner and they would read the chapters and give feedback. And there was a chapter about dating apps and how there's too many choices and we're overwhelmed by the paradox of choice and how do we choose among these all these people. And he's like, I'm a brown man in my 40s. This is mm. not my problem. My right. problem is not choosing amongst the people. My problem is getting matches in the first place. Place. And it was just so fascinating. And at that point, I appointed him as my diversity and inclusion consultant <laughs> for the book, which he actually is the perfectly suited person mm -hmm. to do that Smart. and was really helpful. And what I would say to people is that although you can feel like it's a numbers game, it's actually really just making, uh, sorry, taking advantage of the matches that you do get. And so some of this is basic, but it's, is your profile the best it could be? Is your first picture, which is the one that people are seeing, is it the one that you look most attractive in? Can you take new photos? Can you add humor? Um, with Hinge, we now have roses. Can you send a rose to someone to stand out? And it's actually just understanding that like, yes, there are racial and age and geographic discrepancies and differences that make it more challenging for some people to find matches, but that if you actually really invest in your profile and write those comments that are super thoughtful and put effort in, lots of different people find love on the apps all mm -hmm. the time. And that in some ways you're at an advantage because you're not getting distracted by the mm. masses and you actually have the attention and ability to invest in the matches that you do have. You could also put in your profile stuff like you were saying, and I think I'm going to do this moving forward is lean into like growth mindset or, you know, loyalty or some of the mm -hmm. things that you were saying actually do matter a lot more than we think. Oh, yeah. I think people should be bold in their profiles. I was talking to someone today who was telling me about how she had been, you know, prior to COVID using the apps just to hook up. And she was like, it was really fun. And it was what I needed after the breakup. And I put what I'm looking for 
our casual interactions. Mm -hmm. And she was like, so many people are afraid to put what they want, whether Mm. it's casual interactions or a serious relationship. And it's like, why don't you just think about that as a filter? And why don't you just be more real earlier on? And people are attracted to vulnerability. They're drawn to the magnetism of people being real. And if you just put yourself out there and you're like, been on here for a while, like would love to find someone to build something serious with, like, sure, you'll turn some people off, but aren't those the people that you didn't want to be with anyway? And like, in general, if there's some like big takeaways that I can give people, one of them is just be real because eventually you're going you're gonna to have to be yourself anyway. Why spend those first six months wearing a mask? And the right. other one is throw out your checklist. You're probably wrong about what you want and you're so much better off being open-minded and then spending time with someone and seeing how they make you feel. Well, I was going to say that. I'm not saying K-Town's like this, but there are men that I've talked to that say like, I don't get any matches, but then they're passing up people left and right. So I think you also need to look at your own behavior also. Like, I think there is a vicious cycle on dating apps that people don't like, they always think they can do better. And I think you actually talked about this on our last episode that just because you see all these smiling faces, (laughs) it feels like all these people are like hitting on you at a bar when they really aren't. Like you think like there's all these people out there. So then you start to get pickier and pickier. So there, I'm sure there are some people that truly aren't getting matches, but I think you should also look inwards too and say like, am I putting out as much or am I being too picky either? Yeah, that's a great point. And like, I'm imagining a person in my mind, not a real person, but like, I can really imagine that archetype. And they say, oh, I don't get any matches. The apps don't work for me. You know, people are doing this against me. But if they sat down with their friend and maybe even showed them how they swipe or how they decide, their friend might say like, that person looks fantastic. Like, why aren't you interested Mm -hmm. in that person? And so this is where we get to this main theme, which is like, what are your patterns that are holding you back? And if you blame the environment, if you blame, oh, the matches don't like me or this app doesn't work for me, that's an excuse. But if you actually look within yourself and say like, well, what are the things that are within my control Mm -hmm. and how can I actually be more open-minded or develop this skill or break things off sooner when the person clearly isn't interested, that's how you break out of the pattern. And so for that person... I would encourage them to look at their own swiping behavior and see if they could actually be more open-minded and be interested in different types of people. Here's a strategy I want to run by you. If we don't really know what we're looking for and we're just kind of blindly swiping through, do you think our friends can find better matches for us? And how do you feel about having your friends swipe for you? Yeah. So, so, One thing that I talk about a lot in the book is this idea of dating blind spots. So these are patterns of thinking, patterns of behavior that prevent you from finding love, but that you don't have access to. So they're what's holding you back, but you couldn't necessarily identify them. And I have this quiz that's on my website that's called the three dating tendencies. And it's a way to figure out what your dating blind spots are. But another way to figure out what your dating blind spots are is to ask your friends and say to your friends, look, I'm really interested in changing. Why do you think I'm still single? Why do you think I'm struggling Mm -hmm. with? And that's their opportunity to say, you're too picky or you're not picky enough or you consistently date guys that aren't interested in you. And then when they tell you that, you try to convince them to be interested in you or you date women for three months and then you dump them because you're always looking for the next best thing. And so if we actually just take time to look at our dating blind spots, it really helps us identify those patterns that we need to change. That being said, matchmaking is hard. And I think knowing your friend's bad habits is maybe easier than knowing the type of person that your friend would be great with. So I've seen Mm. this, you know, I've seen the apps where you swipe for someone. And I think from time to time that can be useful. But the thing I would more focus on is have your friends illuminate for you your dating blind spots and have them be your accountability buddies in getting over those blind spots and having better. So I feel like we've talked about how to get smarter at dating. We've talked about the apps at length. We've talked about like looking for the life partner over the prom date. Is there anything else that can help people like kind of get out of their own way and start to date smarter? Yes. Well, Julie, there is a story that I tell in the book about this guy named Jonathan, where he told me, I'm looking for a six foot four business executive and I want him to be really masculine and have these traits and all of this stuff. And he would go on dates and he would like the guys, but then he would say, we just didn't have the spark. 
<laughs> and I kept hearing that. I'm sure you hear it all the time. I didn't feel the spark. Right, right. And so there was two issues with what Jonathan was doing. One issue is that he was going on these really boring dates. He was doing 7 a.m. coffee dates. He oh, God. He didn't have that caffeine in him yet. No, who feels sexy at 7 a.m. in a Starbucks? No one. And if you do, that's something else. And so the dates themselves, the environments of the date, they felt like job interviews. They were really quick. There was no time for the person to, you know, to warm up, to really show who they were. That was one problem is that the date felt like job interview. The other issue is what I just say, fuck the spark. Mm. Let's all say it together. Fuck the spark. Fuck the spark. <laughs> That's your tagline, Logan. That's my tagline. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's obviously, you know, it has a curse word in it. It's trying to be provocative, but that's I want you to remember it. And throughout the book, I just want people to consistently see that that what you think you're looking for, which is this like immediate spark, this moment of intoxication, mm. the world stops around you. Like, yes, that can happen. It's real. There is a thing called the spark. People definitely feel it all the time, but that's not the only way to date. And there's a few myths that I would love to bust around the spark. Yeah. So one of them is if you don't feel the spark in the beginning, you'll never feel it. No, that's not true. Lots of people who are in great relationships did not feel the spark when they met and they worked together for a while. There's something called the mere exposure effect the longer like you around someone. <laughs> yeah. Like why we're the perfect example. I mean, I did feel an attraction to Scott when we met at that at that lunch. But yeah, I mean, think about the dating app and we had known each other for so many years. And so it really grew over time. It grew from friendship and from just enjoying spending time with him. So yes, great sex and a connection can grow over time. And that's why lots of people marry one of their friends or someone they work with. The next one is that if you have a spark, then it's a great relationship. No, that's mm. not true. Mm -mm. Lots of these people, nope. they spark with everyone, <laughs> right? This Burning Man guy that I really liked, well, turns out lots of people liked him too for the same reasons. He was very sparky. He was charismatic. Sparky. He knew how to make people fall for him. Doesn't sparky. mean that your connection yeah. is there. It means right. they're sparky. And sometimes it's, it's, it's associated with some negative things, with, with narcissism, with love bombing, with what did you call them? Future fakers. Future, future fakers. fakers. Those yeah. are all associated <laughs> qualities. And what you're feeling is is maybe anxiety. I don't know if this person likes me. I don't know if they're going to show up. It's it's actually anxiety that we mistake for chemistry. And the other myth is that your how we met story matters. It's not true. Think about the length of a long relationship. It's this tiny portion. It's like 0.01% mm -hmm. of how long you're together. And oh, we had this great love story and we're meant to be. And that's why I'm staying in this relationship that doesn't work. No, it's like, who cares what your how we met story is? It doesn't matter, right? Like it's just the intro. What matters is the relationship itself. So what I say is fuck the spark and go for the slow burn. And the slow burn is the person who the more time you spend with them, the more you like them. They are this gem that you have to discover. They're the person that maybe other people don't see their qualities in them. And the slow burn is who you want to marry because that mm. is the person that gets better over time. And the spark, like that person's fizzling out. Like be with the person who is consistent, who's reliable, who brings out the best side of you. Not that person who when you met, your heart was fluttering because like that is a great feeling, but you shouldn't make a long-term life decision based on that feeling. Yeah. And also we need to take inventory of all the times we felt the spark. Because when you said that to us last time, I I went back to my history and thought, hmm, who did I feel a lot of spark with? And those were the people who were not communicative. Mm -hmm. They were in my eyes very mysterious because they weren't communicating. And <laughs> I created the spark in my own fucked up mind. <laughs> it wasn't right. between the, it wasn't between two human beings. It was just what was made up in my mind. I love that. That's so that's exactly the situation. I think though, okay, so online dating I do think makes that a little harder though cuz I could see like your story with your husband that you guys knew each other over time and I've definitely had situations like that before too that friends have grown over time. But I feel like in today's world with dating apps when people don't have a great first date, they're quick to move on. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give for people to like kind of let it ride out a little longer? Yeah. So I have two things from the book that I'm excited to share with you. So one of them is what I say is a default. Make the second date a default. And what that means is lots of people go on first dates. They have in their mind, could I marry this person or not? Are they good enough for me or not? They're just evaluating them the whole time. And they are really missing out on what it feels like to be on a date. And the point of a first date is, do I want to go on the second date? It's just paying attention to how that person makes you feel. 
The second thing is that lots of people are missing the slow burn. So if you make the default the second date, then you don't spend the first date saying, am I going to go out with them again? You assume that you will. And mm-hmm. then you actually are relaxing and you're giving them a moment to to really warm up. And this is based on some really cool behavioral science research that shows the power of defaults. And if you think about it, imagine you go to a restaurant and you get a hamburger and they say, uh, it comes with fries. Do you want to switch to a salad? Or it says, the hamburger comes with a salad. Do you want to switch to fries? What's most likely going to happen is that you stick with whatever they mm. they did. So in one, the defaults a salad. In one, the defaults the fries. And so we just tend to stick with what our rule is, tend to stick with the mm-hmm. default. And so if you create a rule for yourself, this default of the second date, then you are more relaxed on the first date and you're more likely to find that slow burn because they are getting a chance to really show you who they are as opposed to people looking Mm -hmm. for the spark who miss it. The second thing I want to share with you is this thing I have in the book called the events decision matrix. And what Mm -hmm. it is, is it's a way to decide what events to go to. And obviously, this is a little more complicated during COVID because these events don't happen all the time, but there are online virtual events that are happening. And so what it is, is you basically think of a two by two matrix and what the two lines are, are What is the likelihood that I'll enjoy this event? And the other line is, what is the likelihood that I'll interact with someone at this event, right? And so you plot different events on it and you say, okay, going to the gym in a weightlifting class, that's something that I enjoy. So high likelihood of enjoyment, low likelihood of interaction. Okay, I'm going to a movie screening of my favorite movie, high likelihood of enjoyment, uh, low likelihood of interaction. And then you keep plotting them. And if you find one that's high likelihood of mm-hmm. enjoyment and high likelihood of interaction, you go to those events. Like a dateable mm-hmm. event. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it's like, what? why it matters so much is high likelihood of, of enjoyment means that even if you don't meet anyone, it was still not a waste of time. You liked right. it. If you like that kind of event, it's going to bring out the best side of you. And then high likelihood of interaction, invest your time in places where people are actually speaking to each other. And maybe that's a book club. Maybe that's a sounding board event. Maybe that's going to your friend's <laughs> online party, right? No, it's true. Right. It's like, yeah. the inter- you know, I loved the sounding board event because the videos were on, right? Mm-hmm. And it was like one of the more fun Zoom events I've been to because people were actually interacting. And I know that it's challenging in this time to meet people and those, those IRL interactions are much harder, but you can still figure out ways to expose yourself to people who are interesting and who you can interact with and you can just you can just see how it feels. So I just want to clarify right now, the second qualifier is your likelihood of interacting with anybody, right? We're not talking about romantic interaction. We're meeting someone of romantic interest. It's just interaction with anybody. Totally. Yes. Right. And it, it's a little easier if you see it, but kind of the idea is like, if you go to a four person dinner party, you're going to speak to every person at that dinner party. If mm-hmm. you go to a movie, no, movies are silent. Yeah. If you go to a um, writing workshop, you're probably going to do some solo writing, but you're probably also going to share with the group. And so you can really think about like, okay, when I've been to something like this before, how much are you by yourself? How much are you speaking with people? And you want to nail that upper right hand corner, which is high likelihood of interaction high likelihood that you'll enjoy the event. And I have had clients who were single for years. The dating apps did not work for them. And they plotted events in this upper right-hand corner. They showed up to those events and they felt like a different person. They went from having no dates to having six dates. I think like, I mean, I'd love your take on this, but I think sometimes people go to these events like looking for someone. Right. And I think a lot of times the best situations are when they're more organic. And also like, I mean, I'm partial to this because I used to run a platform that like connected people for years like this. But like, I think like, for example, you and I met through there and that's Mm -hmm. like launched this whole thing. And, you know, and it's like, I did meet a boyfriend through there, but I've also met more friends and they could introduce me to someone. So there's so many different paths, but I guess like from your perspective, like what's another benefit of going to this event, even if like you don't meet someone romantic. Yeah. So the benefit is that you, right, you're you're plotting high likelihood of, of enjoying the event. It's still something that you're doing for yourself. And so I wouldn't say like, oh, um, I'm a guy and women love 
these running clubs. So I'm going to join the running club, even though I hate running, right? Like you, you should have the expectation that you may not meet anyone and that that's okay. And it's still a worthwhile thing to do. And that helps prevent burnout. If you're just going to events to meet people and you consistently aren't, then you're going to feel burnout. And if you go to an event, you don't enjoy it. It's not going to bring out the best side of you. And so I think that's why that upper right hand corner is so magical because it combines um, bringing out the best side of you will be fine even if I don't meet anyone and increases likelihood of meeting someone. In terms of mindset, I do think that you should go and say, I'm open to meeting someone. And the reason why that matters is you need to look approachable. Like Mm -hmm. um, for an in-person event, like don't be on your phone the whole time. Don't have headphones in your ears the whole time. Don't stand in the corner with a friend not looking approachable. Go with a wing person who knows that you're trying to connect. And I know what you were getting at, which is like, if you're too forced and like, I need to meet someone. And if I don't, it's a failure. That's true. I also want people to be approaching these things intentionally and saying like, it's more comfortable to hang out with my friend, but that's not the point. I'm going to take the time to actually invest in in meeting other people. Yeah. I think Julie was also speaking from PTSD because we've been to one too many (laughs) events with some girlfriends who are like, I'm here to meet a man. And they get so pissed when they don't meet someone by the end of the night. And they're like, ah, my night is ruined. So it's just, you know, like the mindset, like you're there to meet just other people. with the with a likelihood of meeting someone that you may be romantically interested in. Yeah, I I totally hear you on that. I think the key is to have the mindset of openness and the mindset of optimism, but not necessarily the mindset of desperation. Mm-hmm. And I've heard from guys, they say, oh, I went on a date with this woman. I felt like she was auditioning me for the role of husband and you know, she was being curious too quickly and this and that. And I get it. Like if you've been dating for a while, you want to find someone like you don't want to waste your time, but your mindset going into the date, how you're showing up, how you're showing up in these events, people are reading into that. And that's why, you know, if you're not feeling dating right now, like take some time off and and feel better and get back in the game. And like I was saying this before, it's not about, it's not about going on more dates. It's about going on more intentional dates. Mm -hmm. And that might look like fewer, better dates. I feel like there's so many things that I took away from this. So thank you again for being with us. But I think, I mean, let's go into maybe takeaways, but I love this part about like what really matters. I love your analogy of the prom date versus the life partner, because I do think oftentimes we are looking for someone that checks the boxes or is down to have fun or whatever it is. And it's not that that isn't important, but there needs to be more there also and not overlook the stuff that really matters. So I know like as a takeaway, personally, like I will start to like ask more of the questions that leads to like some of the things that you said actually do matter more in terms of like growth mindset and loyalty and all that stuff that you just can't get from a dating app. So I think just knowledge is power essentially with what really matters. Yeah, I think just putting it all in perspective as someone who is in a relationship, this is all very applicable to me as well, because sometimes I get so bogged down with the immediate results. Mm -hmm. Well, why aren't we going in this direction? Why aren't we making this happen? And then I have to step back and think, in 30, 40 years, would any of this matter? And no, it probably right. would not. And I really liked how you said you and Scott just kept dating. And I feel like that's how dating should be. You just right. keep choosing to be with each other. Mm-hmm. So when we encounter these situations where you're like, ah, I just feel like this person's making it hard for us to keep going. There is an issue with that. I think we can dig a little deeper instead of making excuses for mm-hmm. that relationship or the other person. I think like in a, in a true uh, healthy relationship, it's two people choosing each other. It's not one trying to convince the other person to get back on this train. So we really just have to be more in, intuitive with that kind of situation. So I appreciate that reminder because, uh, you know, sometimes we get off the train and we're like, Ugh, like, what, what is it that I really want? And then you start making up stories in your head. <laughs> For me, for me back in the dating scene too, it's like when things are hard at the beginning, like that is like, you know, that's what it's supposed to be easy, essentially. Like if things are so difficult at the beginning, what's it going to look like when someone's like ill or like when there's serious stuff going on? So I think this like big picture thinking of like, do I really want to be with someone that makes it so difficult? Like you were saying, UA, remember like, I always think of your mom. I don't know why I always think of this, but like in a comment, how like your mom was like, is this 
really what you want to be doing in a relationship, like convincing someone the whole time that like they must do all this, th- all the things you want them to do. And I think like from what you said, Logan, it's like that stuff, it, it just, it, it's an indicator of difficulties in the future, which, you know, is really not, it's not the life partner. Yeah. I, I love so much of what you said. And you, I just want to, uh, talk about the nuance of what you were saying about, you know, Scott and I just kept dating. And I love the way you said it, which is we kept choosing to date. And there's a chapter in the book called Decide, Don't Slide. Mm. And so often people, they just on this relationship escalator and they just say, oh, I guess we've been dating for a while. Let's move in. I guess we've been moving in together. I guess we live together. Let's get married. And they're not really stopping and saying like, are you the right person for me? Is this the life that I want to build? Do we have the same vision of the future? And so taking a step back and saying, let's decide to the the next stage instead of just sliding into it that's so powerful and if people do that more at every stage of the relationship whether it's the DTR or the move in or deciding to get engaged people are going to wind up in relationships that actually suit them versus just sliding into the relationship that mm-hmm. they happen to be in oh I'm just can we just for anybody listening to this just rewind that whole thing like <laughs> what Logan just said because it's a good reminder for life in general we're constantly making decisions for our lives on a minute by minute basis so let's make those conscious decisions instead of just letting life pass by and sliding into what could possibly happen next. You have control of your life. This is way beyond just your love life too. Absolutely. Well, thank you for summarizing that. It's great. You know, I, I wrote this book. I put it out into the universe. Some people have read it. You guys have had a chance to look at it. And it's just yeah, so it's cool wonderful. To have a conversation. Well, thank I'm, you. Yeah, I'm so excited. Tell us more about where people can get it because I loved, love, love the book. And I think all the dateable listeners will definitely love it as well. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. So it's available on Amazon. You can get it in the Kindle format. You can get the audiobook, which I read. And if you liked the sound of my voice, you can get it. If you didn't like the sound of my voice, don't get the audiobook. <laughs> and it's also available at most indie bookstores. So there's something called Indie Bound. If you search how to not die alone, it'll tell you the local bookstore near you that has it. And people can connect with me on my website. It's loganyuri.com. There's a really cool quiz there, the three tendencies quiz, which helps mm-hmm. identify or blind spots and they can follow me on Instagram at at Logan Yuri. All right. We'll link all of this in our show notes and definitely get a copy of Logan's book and buy a few to gift to your friends because I think <laughs> it's sort of like our dating Bible, I feel like. I sense a dateable book club coming on. So <laughs> get your copy while it's hot. <laughs> That's the dream. Thank you so much for having me. And as a regular, I can't wait for our next event or podcast yep. recording together. Yeah. Regular VIP Hall of Fame. You are everything to us. And for our listeners, if you like more awesome guests just like Logan, please give us a good rating in Apple Podcasts. It really helps us, again, legitimize what we do, but also prove that we are here to serve you. We're trying to deliver information that will really help you in your search for love. And Logan is one of the key players in that. So Apple Podcast ratings really help you know, think of it this way. You're indirectly helping your love life by giving us a good rating in Apple yes. Podcasts. Karma. <laughs> good karma. Good karma. I agree. Good and karma. the more people who listen to Dateable, the better the dating ecosystem and the better. Yes. Friends. So, so rate, share. rate and review. Five stars, please. And share it with Thank a friend you. or your good. Tinder date. I love this. Get more people dateable in the ecosystem. Thank you so much again, Logan. All right. We're going to wrap up this episode. Stay, Stay dateable. dateable. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcast. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag Stay Dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. And thanks for staying all the way to the end for the audio sample of The Duke's Heist by Erica Ridley. Miss Chloe Winchester burst through the door of her family's sprawling residence in semi-fashionable Islington, followed closely behind by her sister Thomasina. 
Chloe's pulse raced with excitement. His arrogance, the Duke of Frosty disapproval, didn't have a chance. Unable to keep her exuberance to herself, she yelled out, I have news about the painting! In a more respectable household, a young lady might expect censure for being so vulgar as to shout, even within the confines of one's own home. Such a young lady might also be rebuked for donning trousers and strolling about Westminster under an assumed identity. Chloe was grateful every single day not to have such limitations. Her roguish brother Graham appeared at the top of the marble stairs, delight and disbelief writ across his handsome face. He was used to being the one with shocking news to share. Don't stand about. Come up to the planning parlour at once. I'll ring for tea. Exchanging grins, Chloe and Tommy dashed up the marble stairs, their grey cotton trousers allowing them to take the steps two at a time. In seconds, they joined Graham in the planning parlour, the communal private sitting room the six siblings used for plotting their stratagems. Chloe and Tommy tossed their matching beaver hats onto the long walnut and burl table in the centre of the sound-dampened room. Tommy rubbed a hand over her short brown hair, causing it to spring up at all angles. Graham moved a pile of scandal sheets from the table to the map case to make room for refreshments. Tommy and Graham launched themselves into their favourite needlepoint armchairs between two large windows outfitted with heavy calico curtains of ruby and gold. Chloe was far too excited to sit. Instead, she paced the black slate floor which still contained traces of chalk from the last planning session. She paused before the unlit fireplace and lifted her chin. For as long as she could remember, two paintings had always hung above the white marble mantel. One of them had been missing for the last eight months. But it wouldn't remain missing for much longer.